And we are here once again. Too bad this Sunday today we don't have a big name guest with us. It'll just be little old me to discuss some things that I have come across during this week. Um, there's been a lot of um, people that are using QImage. There's been a lot of people that are getting these weird um, reports from some of these um, sites that are just vilifying you know the printer companies saying really nasty things about them that they are robbing us blind and some of you may believe that but you know what the reason that i exist in this uh, venture of ours is to help you get over as i have been able to in the past 22 years doing this digital printing thing um making this an affordable craft and believe me, I have done everything there is to be done wrong and found out ways to correct those big, almost fatal mistakes along the way. I rely a lot on other people that have been doing it more than I had because during the first few years, in fact, during the first 12 years of 2000, I was already still working, and so I really didn't have time to devote to this as I was able to do after I retired, fully retired in 2012. I have been already retired from the Army in 89, but um, I went to work for the uh, government as a private contractor, so I was busy, didn't have much time. I was experimenting and becoming more exposed to very well, these were really, really super advanced machines for their time. Big roll units called iris, like the flower. And they would uh, basically just use four colors, literally siphoning the ink out of a gallon bottle. Everything was dye-based back in those days. And these printers printed very low resolution. But if you printed a huge poster and stood back, they were really meant for graphic-type work and not necessarily for continuous tone imagery like we want to do now. So back then, yeah, that was that was the printer. And it was about a hundred and something thousand dollar printer back in those days. But anyway, we have evolved to what we have today. And so along the road, I made many mistakes, spent way too much money trying to solve things and come up with information that really wasn't available because, again, it was a new emerging field. No one really had that much experience, including the printer manufacturers. 
themselves. They really did not know much about ink formulation, how they would react with certain paper coatings, all of that stuff. So anyway, we are happy to report that everything is honky-dory nowadays. These printers produce amazing results that surpass in many ways what you used to be able to get in the darkroom. Okay, the look of film, which had grain, it had a grainy structure. Yeah, that's no longer available in digital photography unless you create it using special filters. But again, that's only if you really are hardcore film fanatic, you can go ahead and do that or scan negatives in slides and so forth and print those. Uh, you're going to be surprised at the lack of resolution compared to today's digital camera results, which of course you can add grain to uh, as you edit, the, you know, and adjust and alter those images to your taste. So my subjects for today, and I'm going to start off, and I, I did a video which I never really uploaded because I, I thought maybe I shouldn't do that. But somebody posted a report that was done by, I believe, someone in the legal field that has nothing whatsoever to do with printers. I think it's just maybe some kind of legal person, a lawyer possibly, how printer companies, especially Epson, that's, that's who they accuse purposely. And here's the key word they use, pre-program printers to die at a specific date. Well, that's not true. Okay, that is not true. Anything mechanical will eventually either wear down or up and die for no reason. Heck, people up and die. And then the autopsy says unexplained reasons. You know, so um, things happen. But the accusation that you buy that printer today, it was manufactured last year, it just finally got to the store and you bought it, and it's predetermined to die at a specific date in the future, regardless of how much you use it or how little you use it. Bull, okay, that's not true. And even if it was, even if it was, they would not last long because the lawsuits would be, you know, horrendous, okay, one after the other. So, yes, there are some things that are specific to inkjet printers that can cause what could be perceived as a pre-programmed death. We'll talk about that, and I'll show you ways that you can basically circumvent that. That main thing, because this article finally got to the, the nitty-gritty, if you will, and they actually identify what they're talking about, this sudden death. Okay, Nothing to do with an actual pre-programmed, meaning that after so many days, it's going to die. No, that's not true. So as much as I sometimes don't like Canon, you know, Epson and all the others, they, they don't do that. And this reason for these sudden death affects all inkjet printers okay, out there, including even lasers. Yes, I'll explain why a little bit later. Also, I'm going to show you an example. Now, you've seen what I can produce on the XP 15,000, right? And you have seen what I can now produce on my 8550, my EcoTank. And I am using OEM on the EcoTank simply because it came with it in a lot of it. 70 milliliters of ink came each color. So why, why would I even consider third party, which is available? when I can actually afford to every year, once a year, possibly, maybe even more, less or more, I think it's like $85 for a complete set of bottles that I can just use to refill my printer. So why bother? Now, the XP15000 is a different animal. That has cartridges, unlike the EcoTank printers that have 
tanks, big tanks. So yeah, those I would consider refilling if you're able to. And in the past year or so, we did not even consider the XP-15000 as a viable unit that any of us, us crazy people, okay? We're a certain category. We're very small compared to all the printer users out there. We, we do things that are a little, little bit different. We find ways to refill our cartridges, maybe because you don't want them ending up in a landfill. That's my reason. I hate throwing away plastic, you know. So it's got to be recycled some way. And the way I recycle them is I refill them. Simple. Now, what about my chips? I should be able to reset those chips. Well, you can't. So that, that's one reason that printer really never became one that we would consider even talking about, okay? Regardless of how good the output was. So out comes a special firmware that renders it chipless. Ah, now we don't have to worry about the chips, but we have one problem. We don't know at what point those cartridges may go empty. And if that was a Canon printer, I would be scared to death because I would not want that print head to attempt printing thinking it had ink because of the chipless firmware and really not having ink. That channel would immediately overheat and die after a certain number of cycles, printing cycles. So Epson printers don't have that problem with their print heads. They do not use heat. So that would not be an issue, but you would immediately see a sudden change in color output, possibly even missing areas of color. So you got to be more careful is what I'm saying and more systematic on your approach to refilling. Refilling is a piece of cake. Flip the cartridge upside down so that the port is facing up. Bottle with ink with a needle. Drip, 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 drip. Put the cartridge on a scale. And if you do not wait until it's actually empty, you will be able to get it up to a total of 27 grams, I think. A little bit less than 27. Usually around 26 point something. That's good enough. That is nearly factory fill. Actually, it's more than factory fill. So that is, you know, that's one printer that you can continue using pretty much until mechanically it wears out. It's not going to die on a specific date. It does not have a death warrant. No, no, it does not. Okay, get that, get that through your heads. Those people out there that are fear-mongering and accusing these companies, I don't know what they do behind our backs, but the truth is, is they're not pre-programmed to die, folks, okay? They do have what is considered a so-called lifespan, okay? But it's not a pre-programmed date where they're going to croak on you, right? So that that's don't believe any of that baloney. It's, it's all bunk. Okay, we're going to talk about QImage. Fit to page, fit to paper. Mm. There is a slight difference, and he's going to probably change that. We had a conversation after or before, I think, no, Baloney, on, on email, where I made a mistake, and I was not choosing the correct one on my video that I did, my demo video that I did after the live stream last Sunday. So we're going to cover that. He's going to change the name to make it more for regular people like you and me to understand what that means, what fit to page and fit to paper actually means. We're going to look at that. Disabling ink monitoring on the Pro 1000. People are still doing it wrong. They're doing it wrong and they're ending up with a chip that cannot be disabled. So we'll cover that. We're going to look at the Pro 1000 maintenance tab and see what it has, okay? People are complaining that my printer is going to sleep on its own. And every time I wake it up, it runs a cleaning cycle. We're going to cover how to disable that and a couple of other things that are available there as well. Let me see. 
Yeah, so that that's going to be you know maintenance tab exploration. The there's another setting as well that will allow you. Let me move this up in the queue here. Allow you to disable margins. Okay, what that means simply is this: that when you choose certain papers on a Pro 1000. You can do it on the Pro 1000, the 2100 and up, but not on the Pro 300. I don't know yet. I would have to get my hands on the driver and actually experiment with it. But on the Pro 1000, you can disable that so that when you're running, say, a fine art paper, it forces you to accept a very wide 30 milliliter, 30 millimeter, not liter, liter 30 millimeter border on the leading and trailing edge. Well, that takes like an inch and a quarter already away from your total uh, printable space. Uh, that's not good. It does that for reasons that we already know. Paper is not really supported that well in the leading and in the last inch of it because the rollers have already become the either they have not grabbed the paper yet or supported the front edge or the last edge is basically unsupported. It's being transported, but it could do this. It could actually skew depending on the type of surface, whether your rollers are slippery because they're getting old, okay? They get kind of glassy instead of being kind of soft and, and, and rubbery and, and sticky that actually can grab the paper securely and, and transport it. It will tend to skew. So that's why they gave you this, this wide trailing and leading edge border restriction so that the paper advances like an inch and a half almost. Some of them are 35 millimeters. And so by that point, it's already securely being transported. And the same thing at the end. The last edge of that image is going to be about an inch and a half before the actual edge of the paper. But we can disable that. Then you're on your own. Hopefully nothing bad will happen. And you know when you choose, specifically when you choose borderless, you know what happens there too. You're printing all the way beyond the edge and there's no support. Of course you're going to get an artifact. And I, I don't understand why people still today want to print borderless. It really causes problems. And it's not something that printer companies are going to probably spend too much time trying to solve okay it's not going to happen they really don't care they have provided with you provided you with the option but they're not going to go out of their way they're not going to you know go the extra mile to to provide extra support at that point where you're literally printing beyond the edge of the paper um not going to happen so we're going to show you uh somebody asked about um Q images interpolation, and uh, we're going to show you how that works. I'm going to I'm going to find a low resolution image, maybe something that should not be printed, say beyond five by seven, and we'll just print as thirteen by nineteen. Why not, right? Let's print this. We're going to print something this big. Okay, let's go ahead and prep this. I'm going to put the paper in. We'll do that at the end. Here's the paper, and we'll put it in, and it will be there waiting for us. All right. So let's see how many people we have here today. By the way, um, I will have a fairly important announcement uh, in behalf of Precision Colors. Probably, hopefully, around September. So, yeah, he's going to he's checking into something and uh, he's going to provide me the information. Maybe we'll have him on. He's going to go on, on a real vacation. I think the either the first 10 days of September or on the 10th. I, I, I don't know exactly when, but you will see it on his site. He usually will post that he's taking his wife on a vacation and they're going on a cruise. So actually to Alaska. So that's going to be fantastic. And uh yeah, funny. He offered that we go with him. I said, no, 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 no. You don't need to do that. You know, besides, 
my wife and I, we have medical problems. We have, we cannot be away for 10 days. So we have to be in touch with our uh, doctors. Uh, so no, but you know, I, I, I thank them profusely and I, I wish them a wonderful vacation. Hopefully they will be able to truly, truly relax for a change and uh, he'll come back fully recharged and uh, tackle this new thing he's considering. So we'll see what that is when he comes back. So let's go ahead and say howdy to everybody. I hope everybody is excited about what we are going to be presenting today. And uh, oh, we'll look at some printing options in QImage as well. All right, and that'll be fun because of course, there's so much in that print tab and also on the bottom. There's a special tab on the bottom you can access for all sorts of things. Also, there are a lot of presets that you can choose that will take into account. Basically, it analyzes your actual image and applies settings for you automatically. You may want them activated. You may not want to you know, activate them. I would suggest you do. Why not, right? It's there and it's very accurate and seems to work. So, all right, let's begin with Nigel Waters. From Wales, UK, Canon Pro 300 with OEM Inks, Canon 2000D camera, and Q Image Ultimate and Color Monkey. So, Canon and Canon, that's good. You know those commercials. They always show Canon camera, Canon scanner, Canon printer. Yes. Keep it all in the family. Bill Guptill from Bowie, Maryland. A neighbor. That's where my wife's a cardiologist used to be. Uh, but now we go to Walter Reed Medical Center. Uh, that's actually the guy that did her uh, bypass surgery. Had a private office in uh, Bowie. But anyway, glad to have you, my friend. He's got an R2400 with OEM inks. That's a cool printer, man. That is a cool printer. It had a little bit of a problem with paper transport. But, you know, nothing that you cannot fix by running some uh, slightly wetted sheets of uh, paper. You spray them with isopropyl alcohol, run it through, then run a second sheet to dry the rollers, and it will take any stickiness and just junk off the rollers and bring that rubber back to uh, a more uh, pliable condition. You just cannot do this constantly because alcohol will eventually dry out the uh, rubber rollers themselves. There's supposed to be some treatment that you can use, but I don't know if it's actually intended for printers. Emmanuel from Normandy, France. Canon Pro 300 Ink Out Inks, Q Image 1, Color Monkey, and Rudy's holders make digital and argentic. I don't know what that Argentic? Photos. Anyway, glad to have you, Emmanuel. You're always here with us. Bill Biles from St. Petersburg, Florida, Canon Pro 1000. All righty. I think you're new. Welcome. Welcome. William B. from Texas. He has a Canon Pro 1, Canon Pro 10, also a DMP printer. I'm not sure I know what that is. 680A and a DS80 event. Oh, is that like a sublimation printer? Not, not what we normally use in heat transfer, but sublimation like they use at the drugstores. Yeah. I was at the CVS today. The girl was actually changing the roll of paper on the, I think, the 8-inch capacity printer, and she dropped the roll on the floor, and it went rolling down the aisle. Oh, my gosh. I couldn't move because I had somebody in front of me. So, yeah, but that was that was crazy. He, she ran after it and then attempted. I hope that that 30 feet of paper didn't get dirty and people are going to end up with prints with spots on them. I hope that does not happen. Miss Wendy is here, my dear. Happy to see you again from Belgium. Again, that's that's my son's country where he was born. And he she's had she has a pro 1000. That I hope is not giving me any any more problems like the previous one. I know you you had to uh, go through hell with that printer, that original one. 
Jerry Longo is here. Selkirk, Manitoba, Canada, Pro 100, PCSE Inks, Rick Johnson modified CLI 42s. You see, people are using this combination and it is awesome. That's what I use and that's what everybody should be using, not because I get anything out of it. It's just It just works. QMH Ultimate and my excellent instructional videos. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Proof of Jose's point. This is CYH. Still printing with an Epson 1440 using PC inks and QMH. Yeah. Good printer, man. And uh, you know what? Are you using the new inks? They're not super new, but they're like a year and a half old. Uh, he output them for the uh, the six color type printers from Epson. Yeah, awesome. I got cartridges loaded with those right now. Jerry says, excellent video on QMH Ultimate 2023 100 to autocrop or not to autocrop. Could you address fit? Yeah, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about that today. And I agree with you. I agree that the naming is a little bit confusing. I was confused too. And so he's going to address that. He's going to turn it into something more understandable. Okay. Fit to page as opposed to fit to paper. Page is not paper. Okay. Page is the layout. So that I had to hammer in, in, into my brain so that I could understand it as well. And we'll see if I still do or not. We'll, we'll attempt to uh, explore that today. Chris Luck, howdy from Eastern Tennessee. Canon Pro 10, PS, PS, PCSE OEM and x Rite 1 Studio. x Rite. Oh, you got an i1 Studio and QMH Ultimate. All right. I had a little trouble reading that. Um, let me tell you what happened. We're going to pause right here for a moment of silence. But I thought it was going to be a moment of silence. Usually do that when something, something dies. So on this table here, my little L-shaped computer desk, I had some 13 by 19 papers that are now prints that are now over there. And I had this sitting on the edge. Guess who knocked that over on the floor? Accidentally. I was terrified. You know how much that costs, right? So I quickly plugged it in and opened up the app, the application, waited, waited, pulled the USB out of the back, put it back in. I heard the little noise. The lights came on green. It, I had to check. There's 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 a choice for other instruments. And I did not have this one, the Pro 2 chosen. So I chose it and I did a screen calibration and uh, it was fine. So I dodged the bullet. That would have been a catastrophe. So now I have it sitting right here where I would have to be the clumsiest ox in the world to elbow it or knock it over. But it was, you know, my fault. Just like this right now. It's over by the edge. It could just fall right over. Move it over, Jose. Put it right here someplace safe where it's not going to fall. You see what I mean? So be careful. If I can do it, anyone can. Yeah. All right. Harold Goldberg, sunny and 80 degrees in Richmond. We got 81 up here, my friend, uh, up in the D.C. area. Pro 100 PCSE, Cuban Schultz, Rick Johnson, clean carts, and Rudy's holders. William B., what do you think about die sub printer? Well, if you're talking about the printer themselves that do the yellow, magenta, cyan layers on their own and then black for accenting, yeah, they're good. They're they're good. This is what all of these our you know service printing services use. Uh, like I was saying earlier at the CVS, the drugstore, they were replacing the eight inch wide uh, rolls. Obviously, that makes eight by ten prints, and uh, yeah, it works just fine. 
I don't know about color management. I don't know how they do that. Uh, but basically, that's how they work. It used to be very, very uh, involved in the past. I'm talking about before I even had a, a, uh, a so-called uh, inkjet printer. They used a roll, get this, that had, if you just open up the roll, you would see a cyan transparent layer a magenta transparent layer, a yellow transparent yellow layer, and then a black one. And then the print itself, the paper, would would transport that that would sandwich over it. It would somehow, using I don't know what, transfer the first layer, cyan on top of that. It would then retract, and then with perfect alignment by the way you did not get any ghost imaging um the magenta the yellow and then finally the black for accent amazing i i didn't think it was that fantastic looking but that was the earliest version of, of so-called sublimation printers now they they literally use a certain type of ink i don't know if it's the same as sublimation transfer ink or what but um yeah i think i don't know I don't know how they actually work. I would like to see one working internally. I would love to see that, but apparently they they no longer do the the uh, the film type uh, situation. Uh, so it had two roles: one for paper, one for film. But yeah, they're good. They're great for events. They're great for weddings where you have a photo booth and people put on all these all this you know costuming and and have their pictures taken, and in two minutes it's done. But for regular, you know, for our high-end printing inkjet, inkjet is the way to go, especially a good one. Ryan Bookholz, book, book or bush, book, Bookholz. First live stream for you. All right. Welcome. Where are you from, man? Tell us where you're watching from. Alaska is bad for the joints in beard <laughs> and in her. In herd? What kind of herd? <laughs> I don't know. But it is bad for the joints. Actually, you know what? Um, I've, I've been watching so much stuff about Alaska lately. It's just ridiculous. It's gorgeous. Gorgeous. But I wouldn't really want to live there. Um, I don't think I could handle it. Daniel Vulkos from Montani. In, Danny in Montani. Q-Image. On a Mac, Rick Cards PC inks all last week and love the inks over OEM. What printer? Much better read and detail in the prints. Wow. I assume you're talking Pro 100. Yeah. Here we go. Yep. In fact, there was a question just about that. There's a group on Facebook that is specific about the Pro 100. And I... I um, I know Jerry Lonko um, posts there a lot, and Rick Johnson as well. Um, it struck me as if those people really should join my group because there's a lot of um, okay. I don't want to sound like an like an ass, but they these people need to be educated the right way to, in the right direction. There's a lot of there's a lot of misinformation and um, just basically lack of knowledge, if you will. And uh, I, I tried to contribute there, but it, it would take a lot more explanation. And I, I just don't have the time to be typing constantly. She hates it when I do that. Okay. You got to keep that lady happy. Happy wife, happy marriage, right? We all know that. So I tried, I tried to stay away. It's just, it would be just too much work. I let the other two guys help. Ash can. And hi, Jose. Great show. Thank you. All Epson inks, third party inks. I haven't seen any PC inks in my country. Yeah, probably not. We were discussing that during our very, very long phone call the other night. And the reason is that, especially in the EU and even the UK, 
what happens is this. If he ships something to you, okay, say you buy something and you are in Belgium. Let's just pick Belgium. So Belgium is part of the EU now. So you should be able to pay whatever amount. Then when it arrives to you, you pay the VAT to Belgium. Mike should not have to charge you the VAT. And then he has to file his taxes from Canada to pay the Belgians the or the, U, the EU the VAT. So he doesn't want to deal with that. That's one of the main reasons he doesn't ship overseas. It's just one dude doing this. He doesn't have a financial uh, group of people handling his taxes. You know what I mean. So it, it's just difficult. Now, other companies that have a staff of people, yeah, they can handle that. But, you know, poor Mike... He cannot do that. I wouldn't. I would not do that either. There's no way I'm going to do that. It's already bad enough. I got to deal with U.S. <laughs> yeah. Tony Huerta. Happy Sunday, Jose. Pro 4100 OEM Inks. I1 Studio. Just renewed my key image to a lifetime subscription. I hope you use my link. Get a discount. Jerry says, on my previous chat, you missed the other page setup settings on the printer driver, which interferes with key image menu settings. Yeah, I, I don't know what you're referring to here, my friend, but I'm going to show you. See, according to Mike Cheney, you no longer have to go into the driver. Everything is handled within QImage's new um, UI. So... I don't know what you're referring to. You need to really, for specific things like that, you need to go to their forum, send screen grabs, you know, drill them. They will help you. He will help you. It's just him, by the way. Oh, okay. So, yeah, those are the good ones. I was wondering, let me, let me wait a minute whether XP 15,000 formulation is similar to the ones for the uh, 1400 series because they're excellent. William B. Use Color Monkey to make printer profiles for sites. Sublimation printer works great. Yeah, because you're producing an actual print uh, for regular heat transferring or heat transfer sub. Uh, sublimation printing is a pain in the neck to do. Compare image with pro print service looks great for eight by ten. Yeah, that's good. Do you do this as a as a sideline for like events and things like that? Because that's that's what that printer is made for. Those types of uh, printers. Jolly Snyder, Huntsville, Alabama. He's got a bunch of printers: ET eighty five fifty, R eighteen hundred, R two sixty, SC, Sure Color P four hundred, Ink Owl. Inks on that and OEM inks. Awesome. JM Hunter just bought QImage for Mac. Does it have DF like the Windows version? DF is what? Uh, deep focus? I believe so. I believe so. All of the basics that Ultimate carries for their basic printing, the interpolation engine, all of that stuff, I think exists already in QImage 1. And they're adding, they're adding to QMH1 some, you know, progressively more feature, but they don't want to make it to be a super bloated. QMH Ultimate is quite bloated right now. So, um, you know, it's been around forever. So that's that's why you just keeps adding, adding, adding to it. And QMH1 just uh, was created uh, only a couple of years ago. So Dirk Cola or happy to join again since a couple of months uh happy using pro 2100 and ink out inks awesome all right that is it we have hit everybody here we got 48 people wow gee i don't even have a fancy guest today <laughs> all right so let's talk about that what you know pre-programming your printer to die 
that just drove me nuts. I, I, I decided to just not even post that video because it's a little bit too ranty. I really, I really kind of went off, but I just had to get it. It was actually good therapy to do it in front of my little camera to just get it off my chest. So here's what happens. This is what the article was about, that your printer's pre-programmed to die and there's nothing you could do about it. Then as the, as the conversation, not conversation, but the text continued, then I realized, oh, he's just talking about waste ink pads. That's all it was. Waste ink pads are not pre-programmed. Okay, they are not. There's no way in hell they can be pre-programmed because there's no way they can tell how much waste ink you're going to generate. Simple. So, especially on an Epson printer, they don't run the auto or as-needed cleaning cycles. You run them. You run them when you realize, oh, crap, I should have been printing instead of letting that printer sit. I should have been printing because, look, I'm getting all kinds of weird color, lacking yellow, lacking cyan, lacking magenta, lacking black, lacking grays, or whatever. So you run a cleaning cycle, and then you run an nozzle check, and after several attempts, hopefully you'll be 100%, and now you can continue printing beautiful. Okay, So you generated waste ink on printers. And I got this, this sample printhead here. Actually got another one. I put it over here as well. So these printers that have this style of printhead, this is an 8500 Canon printer printhead. The cartridges sit like this. And this whole unit with all 10 cartridges travels back and forth, laying a pass of ink, paper advances, another pass of ink, and they overlap depending on your quality settings or not. If you're printing quick on plain paper, there's no overlapping. It's one pass advances a specific amount, the next pass, and it matches perfectly, no banding, okay? No overlapping, no gaps. And so those types of printers traditionally have internal waste ink pads think of it think of your chassis if you were removing the top off and everything inside of it the last thing you would see that is just not metal and plastic are absorbent pads they line the bottom of the printer from the left side to the right side canon printers have huge huge waste ink pads Knock on wood, my nine, my Canon, not 9,000. That's not working right now. My Canon Pro 100 was purchased, was today, the 14th. In four more days, it will be its birthday. What birthday? Number nine. Okay. Nine years old. Still, no waste ink problem as far as the pads go. So what's going on? You generate waste ink, regardless of how you generate it, and that amount of ink gets counted. It's given a value. It might be an archaic value. It might be an accurate value, depending on the printer type. And that value is saved on a counter, an electronic counter. It starts at the bottom, brand new out of the box, zero. And then eventually reaches a certain level, whatever that happens to be. And this is what I think they're getting at, so-called pre-programmed. Yeah, there is a pre-programmed amount of ink that they will claim is a saturation point for those pads, depending on the size of the pads, depending on how much absorption capacity those pads have. Okay? Okay. So that's, that's what they're referring to. So yes, when you reach a certain level, and in my case, nine years ago, I haven't reached it yet. 
Okay. By nine years into the future, how many generations of new printers have been created? Pro 100 was so freaking excellent that it didn't take, it took literally almost eight years for the 200 to come out. That's how good the Pro 100 was. It didn't require an updated printer. The reason they updated it is for other reasons. It's because of the ink uh, upgrade, because it wasn't producing reds as well as they were hoping for. So th they worked for nearly about half that time developing a new magenta and yellow and cyan ink set for that printer, also red. So, but the pads, again, it depends. If I run a clean cycle every single day, then yeah, I would have probably reached that point. And that printer would have to be serviced. It's not dead. It can be serviced. Or I just replaced with one of my new ones. I got two new ones in box. So no problem there, right? But saying that is pre-programmed, that is totally wrong and very misleading, okay? Now, let's talk about Epson. Since they were accusing Epson, we're going to talk about good old Epson printers. So we're talking about any printer that does not have a stationary cartridge. And, and that's still too broad of a, of, a, of a classification because there are printers that have cartridges that move with the printhead that have user-replaceable cartridges for waste ink. Those cartridges, they reach a certain point, just like the pads. They reach a certain point. Well, how? Physically, no, not at all. By counting the guesstimated amount of ink generated, waste ink generated. Counter goes up, reaches a point, max. Change me. You change it with an empty one. Now, that cartridge you took out may not be full. So... If I did not have a cartridge to replace that so-called full one, yeah, I guess my printer is dead because I can't use it. It will not allow me to use it. But you can circumvent that. It's not like the end of the world. So the drama queen this guy was just makes me laugh because I thought, dude, you have no clue what can be done, okay? I guess they're they're sort of targeting a very broad, non-technical group of printer owners out there. That's what they're trying. That's the, the group of people they're trying to scare. That's probably 90%. Our group of crazy dudes that, that do all these little tricks, very small, okay, by comparison. So, yeah. So, let's look at some of the Epson printers. So, XP15000. Cartridges move along. They do. Um, do I have to worry about ink pads? No. They have user-replaceable boxes. For $10, I bring my printer back to life. In reality, I can reset the chip, believe it or not, and get one more run. No, wait. After it goes full again, reset it again, I get a second run. Wait, wait, wait. After resetting the chip a third time, putting it, I get five runs before the cartridge is actually physically full. Do I have to throw it away? No, you do not. You just take out the soaked, nasty, gunky black pads out and pack it with new pads. Where do I get those? Rick Johnson, right here. He is watching. I know he's in the lurking around the aisles. Yeah, he sells that. Links are on my video description. Nothing will stop you from reusing those cartridges. You never even have to buy a new one. Just repack your old one. You don't want to buy a resetter? They are not cheap. But you can buy chips. Replace the chip every single time. Simple. Even if you don't want to repack it. Replace the chip, use it another run, third run, fourth run. By the fifth run, I recommend you change the packing material. 
Now, the ones that have internal paths, yes, they require, unless you're a outstanding printer mechanic and you have a service manual to show you how to disassemble literally the whole printer to be able to access the bottom. It's, it's, imagine you would have to remove the contents of a 10-story building so you can access the basement. That's what you have to do. I let them do that. If I really want that printer after nine years, I let them do that. Take it to the shop and let them handle it. It's about $150. If you paid about $400, $500, $600 for your printer, you might as well do it. You might as well do it. It's like getting a brake job for your car. Okay. You just, that is a, a, a part that gets used the pads. Okay. Just like brakes get used every time you slow down your car or stop it. So it's not, a, it's not a predetermined death warrant. Okay. It's not. So let's look at some of the tools that we have available that will allow you to circumvent that little problem. Now on Epson printers, especially the 1400, the R3000, which is a stationary cartridge printer, but has internal ink pads. Imagine that. The 400, the P400 as well, stationary cartridge printer. Do I have one of those here? Mm, yeah. Here's an R3000 cartridge. These do not move. They stay put, but they don't use a user-replaceable uh, cartridge. They have internal pads. So there is not a universal rule, okay? It does differ. Now, uh, all-in-one Epson printers, talking about units that have, they sort of, sort of kind of look like an HP-type printer. They have a scanner. They have a maybe a duplexer. Um, you know, and then a couple of uh, uh, cassettes for paper size, you know, slightly uh, letter size, and maybe the uh, eight and a half by what is it by 15 or 17 or whatever it is. Yeah, those printers may have either a and underneath the, the body of the printer itself a little latch door that you open up and you pop out some sort of tray with pads. Some of the older, um, I think it was the, I forget, the Artisan series back in the day, the 720 up to like the 830 something, they had a user replaceable so-called waste ink cartridge thing. It wasn't really a sealed unit. It was just a tray with some pads in it. You remove it, put a new one, and you're good to go. It had a chip in it and everything. But a lot of the newer versions, and I'll show you the list that you can actually treat in this manner in a second. So if you do not have a user-replaceable cartridge, you have internal pads. And what you need to do is reset the counters back to zero. That's it. On some Epson printers, you can actually dismantle the right panel, especially photo printers, R2000, R1900, P. R1800, R800, uh, and all of the, the R whatever, they had that functionality. You can remove the right side panel. That's where the perch unit sits. Perch unit operates with vacuum, and there's a little pump with two little hoses that go internally into your pad. They join right there on the side of the printer. You pull out the joint. It's basically just a double-ended joint. Pull out, remove the little clip, Attach the joint again to the incoming line and a piece of tubing to the outgoing line and run it outside and collect your ink in a bottle. That's it. You no longer are pumping waste ink into the pads. So you can reset that thing over and over and over and over until the printer just mechanically dies 10, 15 years from now. By that point, you might want a new printer anyway. You see what I mean? So... Let's go ahead and look at the availability that we have. So normally, you would be told to get the WIC tool, which looks like this. Now, I don't have any of my resettable P400 
printers connected right now to my computer, but they would appear right here. They would appear right here. You would click on one of those and you would have some information come up about that printer here. You would have a, a button to click to read the counters, see what level, what percentage from 100% they are at now. And I have videos. Go back to my, my uh, WIC tool videos uh, in my playlist, and you'll see exactly how I reset about four or five of my printers that way. And so you would find that printer here. You would activate it. You would see information here. Check on the levels. And if they're getting like 80%, 90%, it's time to reset them. You buy a, a reset key, basically a serial number. You enter it. It is accepted. You proceed. It will reset the counters. Now all you have to do is turn your printer off, turn it back on, and then run the, the um, so-called counter uh, check again, and it will come out as zero. All right? So that's a, that's this actually does a lot of other functions as well. It's a little bit difficult to use if you're not technically savvy. You know, if you if you don't know about uh, all of these uh, different other functions that you can actually reset with this. Now there are also, but not readily available, so-called adjustment programs, and that's what a technician would normally use to service your printer at the at the work center or the service center now this is the much more simpler wic tool from inkchip.net so i sponsor them they sponsor me as well they provide me with uh, serial numbers when i need them and so i am here to tell you this is the way to go folks and i have a discount link as well for 10 percent off so it's going to be about $9.99 regardless anyway, either one, either one. So you might as well choose my link and get a dollar off per reset. So you're going to receive a, a serial number. You're going to click here. Let me see. I don't have any printers listed right now because none of them are connected. So the printer would show up here. You would choose that. If you had several of them, they would show up. You choose the one you want to reset. You read the counters here and you reset it here. You just enter the serial number, reset, that's it. All you got to do now is reboot your printer, read it again, it's empty, okay? At that point, it'll be empty. Like I said, I have videos covering several of my printers that I can uh, basically reset in this manner. So that's, that's how you do that. There's no reason, folks. There is no reason for you to, you know, say my printer is now dead. It's so easily fixed, very easily fixed. Absolutely, like I said, no reason. I have printers that have been reset several times. That means that instead of having one life, just like a cat, so-called nine lives on a cat, right? I can I can continually reset those counters. And instead of $150 in the way... Uh, for example, a Pro 100 will cost you about that much. Maybe no, maybe more now. It could be. It could be. It could be a lot more now, considering what's going on with this, with the world at this point. So, simply 9.99, or use my link to inkchip.net. It'll be less. You can also buy the firmwares that will allow you to reset several types of. Uh, to set several types of printers to chipless. Let me show you what you need to look for. So here's what, here's what we're going to check out. We're going to check to see what models are supported, okay? Which Epson models can I actually reset its counters? So we are at inkchip.net, as you can see right here. Let me move over there. Right there, inkchip.net. And WIC, we're going to go to WIC. They can do lasers as well. Oh, by the way, let me go back. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna cover lasers. So lasers use toner. And in some cases, it'll either be a solid toner or a powder type toner, like for your regular black and white type laser printers. Every time that roller gets erased of the previous image that was created on it by toner 
that creates waste that goes into a a a container of sorts so they do create waste as well so they allow you to reset those as well so there is a way to reset laser printers as well so let's go to WIC. so wic and ink chip adjustment program waste encounters WIC. so waste encounters that's what WIC stands for reset utility for epson printers Inkchip provides the best program to reset your printer, Waste Ink Pad Counter. Just download our program, and with the help of the reset code, well, you need the reset code. It's not with the, the reset code is not helping you. It costs $10. So you know what I mean. That reset code activates it. And so you will be able to return your Waste Ink Pad Counter to the level at the zero position. It will just take a few seconds. That's the thing. It's quick. It is almost lightning quick. So here's a situation where they show you. There's a video here to watch. Um, the you get a, a a a an error saying, and this is what they were referring to, that certain parts have reached the ends the end of their life. Yeah, the pads. That's all it is. It's not something mechanical. It's just the pads. And you reset the counter, and you're good to go. Remember, I told you that even the internal pads are not saturated to the point where you're going to have ink overflow on your work table. And that's where they were accusing them as well. Now, you're going to end up with ink all over your work table. No. No. All right. So let's look at this. $9.95 per unit if you buy three units. So you say you have three printers, you buy three units, $6.99 each. And again, you're going to get a 10% discount if you use my link. Let's go to English. So here are all the models. Check this out, folks. These are all the models you can reset. If you live overseas and you're familiar with the L models, this these were the predecessors to the so-called Ecotank models. A lot of these were not available here in the US. Now some of them are, and again, you can reset them. If you're really good, you can possibly access that tube that I told you about that actually delivers the waste ink to the internal pads and then migrate it to the outside. I figure, even if I have to drill a little hole on the side panel so I can pull that tubing through it, it's worth it. Because after a couple of resets, that would have cost me, say, $300, $400 worth of uh, repairs. Not repairs, but, you know, servicing. I think it's well worth it. XP series. Here we go. All the XP models that are serviceable. Workforce. Again, here they are. Uh, what else we got here? Oh, my 1100 is there. See that? That's the one that I was using for uh, sublimation that I had to trash. Stylus Office Series. All of them there. Stylus Photo Series. All of these are resettable. They can be reset. Anybody with an early R2 something or 3 something, there they are. The... 1900 also the eight the 1800 is not here but the r1900 which i have one r2000 which i have one 2400 i used to have one 2080 i have one of those r3000 i have one of those and of course the px series as well and the rx series then the stylus series okay it's just too much folks they're all there artisans these are your 1400 and up. And then the ones that I was referring to, the 710, 720, 730, those are all all in one with little scanners. And uh, some of the, uh, the, the 837 had a duplexer in it as well. They can be reset, even though they had a user replaceable type of a cartridge underneath that you can access and replace. But it would cost like 20 something dollars. So you can take it out, 
You can clean it. You can wash it. Just rinse it under the sink. Let it dry. Put it back in and reset it. And that would work. Sure color. P400 can be reset. 407 for other countries, I guess. 600. And several others. Sure color series, PM, blah, 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 blah. There you go. PX, whatever that is. PM. K series, ME series, ET, eco tanks. Of course, ours is not going to be on there. You know why? We have a user replaceable cartridge, folks. We do not need to worry about that. EP, E series, goodness. How many types of Epson printers can be reset? It's all there. So there is no excuse, folks. Just go by that, check out to see whether your model is. You know, support it, buy the serial number, use that very simple application. You just download it from that same page, uh, and that's it. That's it. You are good to go. Your printer is not dead anymore. It's alive. Drove me nuts, I tell you. It literally drove me nuts that day. All right, what happens when you choose inferior inks on the xp 15000 let me find something first i hope i have it nearby here i think i have it on the other area but it's basically a a um, standard image maybe i have one here You may not. Oh, here we go. Hiding here among all the others. Come on, you had it. There we go. Here's another one. We have several one. Several right here to look at. All right. So, in the standard image that I recommend you guys use. And I just had a recent um, commenter on my Facebook group say that they um, applied to be a member and they have not seen an approval yet. But yet they were able to post in my private group. Yeah, they were approved. They just, they thought they were going to get some kind of approval online or whatever the case. Well, no, if you're able to post, You've been approved. Okay, so nothing to worry about. So standard image will have lots of things included. And it allows you to analyze a lot of things as well. Even though you cannot longer download it from the original site that I still have listed. I did not remove that listing because there it tells you how to analyze this. How to analyze every aspect of this image. So the important thing is not just the kid faces. Of course, they're important. You want to make sure that you're getting the correct representation for skin tones. And we have a Hispanic girl, a Caucasian girl, an African-American girl. I think that's a boy maybe. And a cute little redheaded baby right there as well. So you just look at that. If they look like Martians, no offense to Martians. They might look a little greenish, right? That's that's not good. If it looks normal, just look at it, and it looks normal to you. That's all you have to worry about. And you make sure because one side of the face is lit, the other one is more on, on in shadow. Make sure that the tonalities don't change, that you don't get a bluish shadow side on a normal lit side. Make sure that it all it all looks normal. So here we go. All right, so here is the, the part that, and I'm going to show you the example in a second here. But I'm, I'm just going to use this one. It's too difficult to hold all three of them. It doesn't matter. They're all the same. So right here, this portion of the image right there, there are transitions. You want a printer that is able 
to produce very gradual transitions. Imagine this. Look at this sky right here. Look at the bottom or the, the horizon area of the sky. It's got some clouds down there. And then the blue part of the cyan, really, it's really cyan, not blue. The cyan part of the sky gradually changes in density. It is very, very gradual. Look at that. It's not because that image is whatever. Is that the Grand Canyon? Grand Canyon? Who knows? It doesn't matter. It's the sky. They want us to look at the sky. Look at how gradually that is depicted. You see any banding? You see any, any kind of abrupt changes? Not really. Let me get the reflections out. There we go. So this represents that. So if you can produce, basically what we have is this, fully saturated to black, gradually getting darker and darker, fully saturated to white, fully saturated to white and fully saturated to black. So you have your RGB and your MCY, okay? You want to see gradual. I don't know if I can show you that later. There you go. You want to see gradual. What that tells you is this particular printer, XP15000 with Position Color Inks, Epson Premium Luster, Premium Gloss, and OEM ICC Profile. So there you go. People are asking, can I run... <laughs> The original profiles using PC inks. Again, what do you think? Of course you can. Will you improve running a custom profile? Maybe a little tiny bit. But they are so well calibrated that you get beautiful results. Now, let me show you what not so beautiful results look like. I want you guys to see this. XP XP 15,000. Look at that. Just, just look at how bad that is. Now, this is interesting because right here, let's go ahead and see if I can let's see if I can enlarge this. Nope, wrong one, wrong thing. Let me double click on that and enlarge it. Okay, so I want you to look right here. It goes from dark, and then right about here begins to change drastically. This one here, right up, like up here is already almost black, almost near black. Look at that abrupt change. You know what that would cause in that, that part of the sky? Problems. Let me see if, if it even shows that part. Yeah, I don't know. He doesn't show that part. He should have shown that part. That sky probably did not do very well. So this is due to inks. Everything all from the UK. Thanks for the ad, he says. I'm attempting to improve my printing skills and subscribing to the Toolman YouTube channel. Uh, okay, so let's just get to the nitty-gritty here. Although... The image quality was really good. If you if you look at it, at the image attack, wait a minute. Attached to the green blue area comes out without any graduation in the color. Yeah, that's it. He's using third party inks. No matter what paper, it's the same. Of course, it's the same. Printer head alignment and nozzle check is all okay. Not the cost. Printer driver use without any color correction or standard. Any advice greatly received. It's the inks. It's the inks. The super, super cheap junk inks. Do not use anything but either OEM or in this case, like I have already proven, I don't know what he's using in the UK, 
but PCSE inks for that printer. Fabulous. Okay. And not just because, you know, I sound like I'm getting probably, oh, Jose must be getting 50% from it. No. 0%. Okay. Yeah, he gives me inks when I ask him. I need some inks. He sends me the inks. But I'm not getting paid for each sale. Okay, that's not that's not what I, I do. If the inks did not prove themselves, he would not be doing so well either because I tell it like it is. So are ink owl inks equivalents as good? Probably. But here's the catch. Does ink owl tweak the inks? Probably not. They buy the off-the-shelf ink set for the Pro 100 from where? From image specialists in the U.S. or STS in, in down in Florida, so that's what they do. So the inks will be a good performer. The same thing with even even uh, uh, Octo Ink in in the U.K. Um, I don't know whether that's what he's using. He may be using some cheap Chinese replacement, you know, from eBay. You can get those super super cheap, but they're garbage, and that's what that's what happens. That abrupt now on a real image, you may not even notice it unless you do a back to back comparison with OEM versus cheap ink. You'll get something that looks like, and of course, that photo of the actual prints was horrible to begin with, so it wasn't a good way to represent the results he's actually seeing with his eyes. So, anyway, if you're going to go third party, you got a 15,000 and you're in the US, hopefully, that'll be the only way you can get those inks unfortunately unless what's going to happen maybe around september actually uh, comes to fruition that may solve that may not who knows i uh, will see anyway i cannot discuss it right now so don't even ask so anyway just a little a little tease if you will so that's what happens that's that's the drastic results you get with inks that are just not good performers Sure, they'll print something red, red. They'll print something green, green. As long as it's a solid color without any transitions. Don't even count on it. All righty. One more down. All right. We're doing good. Been on about an hour, 18 minutes. Let's see... Uh, who else has joined us? Oh, we got a bunch of new people here. Hang on a second. Yeah, we had him. 8550, very interesting printer. Good, I, I know. It is. It is a rather interesting printer uh, and a good performer. I mean, I had somebody who was about ready to buy one. They went to a shop that had him, and he examined the printer and didn't want it. He didn't want it. He said it was too flimsy. I, I You know. You're not supposed to beat up your printer, okay? Um, yeah, some of the plastic parts tend to flex, like the paper tray and, and such. But you know, you're supposed to treat it, treat it nicely. It's not some, you know, something you're going to beat up on. It will last you a long time, believe me. It will. Jeff Thompson, he has QImage One has deep focus sharpening. Good. Articles like pre-programmed end-of-life printers are just clickbait. They are. Just like the um, there's a, there's a video on YouTube that gets thousands upon thousands of views and it's nothing but bull. You know what? WC Anderson, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, Canon Pro 100, Kimish Ultimate, PCSE Inks, Rick Johnson's Modified, CLI 42 cards. Not three. I think it means two. Are there any C Life 43 cards? I don't think so. Rick Johnson's lurking. Yes, I know. I can see you. I can feel you, brother. 
I can feel you lurking. We might import a Konaka. Oh, man, I wish I had some of that. William B. Ink for Canon One Pro One. What to use? Um, there is an ink set from Precision Colors, but I'll tell you the truth. What I use is OEM. How do I? How can I use OEM? Well, first of all, right now I'm not using my Pro One too much, but I use OEM that I aspirate from these from so-called empties i used to get a ton of these right now i have i used to get a ton of these aspirate the leftover ink because people tend to pull them out prematurely i don't know why and i'm able to then feed my pro ones i refilled my original cartridges i use single use chips to be able to continue printing and I was selling sets of these that I pre-modified. If you look at the chip compartment, I don't know whether that's focused or not. You can see that I carved out a circular little space there. That's because the single-use chips, unlike these, unlike these OEM chips, have a little ball of, of like a resin. It's a little dome. All single-use Chinese chips are that way. And they just won't sit flat. So I have to machine this. So I would set up, I would, I would remove all of the ink out of a set of 12, remove the chip very carefully so as not to damage the post, mill away that little space, allow you to put a single-use chip, which you would buy from Precision Colors, and I would sell them as a set of 12 for like $60. And that way you would have that set of cards that just will last you forever, as long as the printer will last. Which, by the way, has internal wasting pads. Imagine that. Why would they do that to such a high-end printer? But they did. And again, like $300 to get it fixed. So, But it's not dead. You just got to get it fixed. It can be revived. It's not a, it's not a death warrant. Okay? So... I would, I would have enough ink, enough yellow, enough chrome optimizer, so forth, red, you know, and so forth, whatever I needed to feed my pro one. That's how I did it. But there is also uh, ink set from the uh, company, uh, Precision Colors, for that printer. There's some limitations of what the third-party ink industry can do. OEM inks formulations are very difficult to uh, reproduce it's not impossible but it would cost you almost as much as the original ink anyway yeah the components are a little bit more costly and of course they charge you out the wazoo for the research they did a couple years ago before they you know began to ship that printer you know how it is that's that's marketing for you Jose, I take the wasting from the tank and refill my permanent markers and they work just fine. Yeah, that'll work. Sure. Awesome. Good idea. Daniel Vulco says, I have to ask, what is DF? Is deep focus sharpening? It is a, a, a sharpening mode that will allow you to basically over sharpen more than you would bear be able to with your regular uh unsharp mask for instance and you would not get halos um mike cheney demonstrated that the next to last time he was with us to, uh here on the on the uh, live stream it's amazing it is normally set automatically to like five percent so you don't have to really worry you can actually set it manually and do your own um you know, amount if you want to over sharpen something. It just it's not gonna show halos. Uh halos are caused by a dark little point against a white area or light area, and you over sharpen, you're gonna get a halo around it, which is a really crappy artifact that does not happen with the focus sharpening. That's one of the things that you may be able to notice as far as a difference in output quality, regardless of the printer. 
Okay, if you print out a Lightroom, you can print out a Photoshop, and you print out a Q image, the same image, same settings as far as color management, the sharpening is what's going to give it away. Okay, the level of sharpening, the quality of the sharpening, especially on images that may have needed a little help as far as sharpening. Dog, Doug, Doug, sorry, Stearns from Michigan, newbie. All right. Well, we were all newbies. When you're a newbie now, you're lucky because there's a lot of information out there, not just from me, but from many others as well. If you want to know about what printers to buy and you want to hear what any, practically just about any new printer can do, Keith Cooper. From the UK, he has a channel on YouTube. He does reviews. Canon and Epson provide him with every single new printer available out there. And he will do a review, a full review from head to toe. And tell you what you can do, what you cannot do. You're not going to find refilling or third-party information there. It's just going to be fully original consumables. What is the purpose of the sponges in an ink cartridge? It just holds ink. It's a different type of ink delivery. It's more, it's more, you see, if you get a regular kitchen sponge or bath, bath type sponge and you soak it and you lift it, don't squeeze it, just lift it. Water will drip out of it. It will slow down and then stop dripping. Even though the sponge is still fully saturated by water. If you squeeze it, a ton of water will come out. The sponge holds on to ink, and the print head system applies a need for ink from that sponge. It is a control feeding type mechanism, okay? These do not have a sponge, so they rely internally on the printer to control the amount of ink entering and being used. So the sponge is just that. It just holds it just holds the ink. Here's the sponge. Here's the liquid chamber. Okay? If I take this clip, I would have to have a container here just in case. I may get a drop of ink, but that's it. It'll stop flowing unless I pull this plug. Imagine if you take a drinking straw and you fill it full of water and you hold, put your finger over the top and you can lift it above the water. It will not drip. Remove the finger from the top. All of the water will pour out. That's how this works. It's kind of a hydraulic type feeding system for ink. Originally, way back when print inkjet printers came out, they all were sponge type cartridges. What, what software are you talking about? There are a lot of times that happens because, remember, what are these tools? If you're talking about WIC, what are these tools? What are they doing? Hmm? They're system-altering tools. Of course, they're, they're seen as bad. Okay, so they are proven to be okay. They are not harmful. But because of what the work that they perform is looked at as system altering tools, you are literally altering the counter on your printer. Okay. Believe me, the service center uses one of those tools as well. It's just that they have they the one they use does not require a, a serial number to be entered every single time. I have those tools as well. And they are all seen as bad by antivirus. You got to turn off your antiviral uh, so you can download the tools and use it. Once you use it, zip it and just let it sit there. It will not be harmed and uninstall it. Okay. If you're running your protection system constantly, you saw that I was able to open it here. I got complete protection on this computer. Okay. So... I assume that's what you're talking about, Jerry. 
Daniel Booth is here, Baltimore, Maryland. Another day for knowledge. I am replaced. I have I am replaced my OEM Epson cards with chipless cards. Works great. Yeah, you're running uh, chipless firmware. Yes. Another day of improvement. Success takes time. Follow the path, as so say it has. Thank you, my friend. Always a big supporter, man. Nice guy. Thomas Tuor Tuorto from uh, New Jersey. All right. And look at that. Richard Bender is here from Western Maryland. Received my new drone, but now require a better place. A better piece of hardware to view the flight real time. Yes. Uh, if it's shooting high resolution, you need to be able to play that back. And uh, yeah, happens to me too. Daniel Vulcos. Thanks. I was just wondering on the DF. Yeah, that's what that is their standard uh, sharpening algorithm. Uh, Photoshop uses uh, unsharp mask and other other types of algorithm. You can actually pick and choose. Uh, you can do that in QImage as well if you, for whatever reason, want to revert back to the older type systems. Larry Smith, uh, Epson AT8080. 80, 3830 in Canon G3260 for home use, text and graphics reports. Both have replaceable wasting cartridges. Yes. All of those Canons. Yeah. Um, Rick Johnson sells the components for a lot of these um, wasting cartridges, by the way, guys. So you don't have to pay, you know, more than you have to. And Canon has replaceable printheads. Of course. Yeah. Canon replaceable printheads due to the fact that they basically wear out. They are thermal type firing printheads. That's why they make them user replaceable. And when you install your printer from the beginning, more than likely, except for some models, they already come with it installed. I have a TS-8320 upstairs that came pre-installed. All I had to do was install the cartridges. Oh, you're asking which one to buy. Um, what's the capacity per tank for the 3260 and the 3830 from Epson? That's what would, that's what would sell me, you know, like how large are the uh, tanks? Because I know both of them use a tank system. Okay, let's go ahead and open up Q image. Wish me luck. Sometimes it slows things down. It says I have 16 printers connected. Let me set something up here. I'm going to set up, I got to do do that on my main screen here so I can actually see what I'm doing. I'm going to set up, see I have a square image here and I'm going to go ahead and print it. Let me load my 13 by 13 paper. All right, so here we are. Got, I made, the reason was because I was demonstrating how to do a 12 by 12 borderless. In other words, if I had an image that was a square ratio and I did say a page, a digital page for a scrapbook, I wanna print it 12 by 12. Well, I can't do that. 12 by 12 is not a standard size and I cannot print borderless on it. And even if I could, it would expand the image beyond the paper's edges. And so I would lose part of my image unless I precisely sized it with, with waste on the ends, on the edges. You see what I mean? And, but it's still not a very precise way of doing this. So what I did was I 
created a a a custom size let's see specify one size right here 12 by 12 and then i was able to drop that image inside that space i'll show you so that's 12 by 12 i have a 12 i have a square image i don't know what the dimensions are there are no dimensions it's all pixel dimensions and it depends on your ppi your pixels per inch what size size you'll end up with boom now you can see that i i just put it in there i did not choose fit to page or fit to paper that's fit to paper it fits it to the paper fit to page takes into account the so-called non-printable borders you will get a slightly different you see down here at the bottom watch this fit to page see that what look down here fit to page fit to paper okay it's taking into account that non-printable area and you can see that up here it's supposed to be 13 by 13 but you can only print to i think it's 12.3 12 12.713 by 12.766 at 720 by 720 okay so what he recommended watch i wish i could make this larger so i can show you guys let me see if I can make it just a little bit larger. Look at look at those, those edges. The, the image is being cropped slightly. Fit to page. Look at this. Look at this right here. That's the trailing edge. You see that? Here I am not filling everything. Here I am. Boom. So... Am I cropping a little bit of that image? Maybe. Maybe. But it, it's just minimal. Why? Because not only is my paper 13 by 13, but my image is square. Okay? My image is 3,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels. So, yeah, it's going to remember that that bottom margin usually is a little bit wider the so-called non-printable margin so that's what happened now he's going to re he is going to rename these so that they are less confusing to folks like you and me i was very confused about this as well you're not you guys are not the only ones okay so go back to more let's pick up that you see that now i basically created a 12 by 12 space in the 13 by 13 piece of paper i got every pixel in there as a 12 by 12. now he also showed me last week that i could take that 13 by 13 and simply do this instead of choosing enter a specific size and this is fine if all you want to do is 12 by 12s and and you got 13 by 13 paper you can use 12 and a half by 12 and a half but why not just use a sheet of 13 by 19, cut off, say, what, six inches off of it? You can make a little panorama out of that, thir six by 13, right? But you can also enter a, let's see, a enter a, was it a border, he said. Let me move this over here so I can see. Okay. Specify one dimension border size and he told me just put in half inch so i put in 0.5 same thing let's change that to 0.1 not 0.1 0.25 I should have a quarter inch border. There you go. 
But look, you see that? See the bottom? This is your trailing edge. Let's see what happens. So it's very tricky. Okay, it's very tricky. Let's go ahead and add, make it a one inch border. So that's going to now give us a 11 by 11. But you see that bottom? See, it's always going to be a little bit wider. Now, that's not what I want to do. I want, I want to have a one inch border around that. And I do. I could print that, measure the side. Now, here on, on your on your on your screen, you should be able to see a perfectly centered uh, square image on a 13 by 13 paper with a one inch border all around. That should be able to print. Now you may get a slight error. Paper positioning on printers is not an exact science, folks. It just isn't, okay? It just simply is not an exact science. So especially if you're printing multiple sheets. The first sheet may print okay. The next sheet may slightly be off position, either left or right or did it very accurately grab it and position that edge at the point the printer expects it to be? Again, too many variables here. And so that's, you got mechanical variables as well as these pesky um, so-called non-printable um, margins. We're going to wait and see if in the next update, maybe 101, he has changed this title to be more a little bit more descriptive, let's just say. Okay, he's not here with us today. He's um, if you if you were here with us until the end, you saw the kitty cat that came over. The kitty cat passed away. He had been very ill for a couple of years and been in and out of the hospital, and he finally succumbed. And so, I I, I am very sad to hear that. Uh, I always have been a cat lover. I have had. Um, always at least two cats in our family they've gone to europe with us they've gone to vacations with us i mean people might call me crazy they're all buried in my yard they all have their little tombstones little cinder blocks that i made for them and so yeah anyway enough of that too sad to talk about so let's go ahead and remove that remove this one so you see kind of like what that works like okay it's, it's a very odd way to um, we're going to close this as well as right, right click and remove all. All right. So now if you want to keep this as some sort of um, like a template you can bring back later, you can always save it right here let that open up come on sometime today there you go we're going to call it 12 by 12 on 13 by 13. that's it we don't have to save it as a job we can save it as a well we'll save it as a job but here let me let me show you what happens later so save. Would you like to save the entire job, including images in the queue or just the job settings? Settings. Okay. So now we're going to basically go to something else. We'll close it. We'll open it again. Let's just imagine this is now tomorrow. You're going to print some more pages. You created a bunch of pages in Photoshop that are square and you want to print them and then you want to trim them so that they are exactly edge to edge. And of course, it always remembers what you did last. But let's go ahead and change the paper size to five by seven. Let's just do that. And we're going to go into this folder here and going to find that job that we just created 12 by 12 on 13 by 13 paper. Open. There it is. And I can just drag 
that image on it as well as that page on it okay very nice and we're going to leave this open because we're going to be printing a relatively low resolution image um let me let me go ahead and find it but do we have to speak about something else i think we do and there are a couple more people here Pepe La Pew says, the Canon printer software thingy doesn't even work on Mac OS. What thingy? What, what thingy are we, are we referring to here? Jerry says, Q image on printer settings tab. Click properties by printer setup, page setup tab, and look at page layout. There was, that's where I ran into trouble with interference from image, yeah, Q image menu. Yeah, I don't think you're supposed to even be going into your printer anymore. That's what I was getting at. He did say, don't go into your printer, driver. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about something a little bit different. We'll, we'll let that sit there. We'll come back to it later. Let's talk about Pro 1000 owners that have decided to go this route of turning your cartridges into refillable cartridges. And it's not just the Pro 1000, but the 2000, 2100, 4000, 4100, all the way up. That new family, you can do this on. Let me quickly. I'm going to queue queue up something here in a minute, in a second here. Let me give me one second. One second here. Okay, we're going to use this one here. This will be a good example. We're going to print later on a low resolution image that is actually only 1144 by 699 pixels. Very small. Show you what it looks like. There you go. It's a poster. Superheroes. That looks like the Hulk, maybe. We'll see. We'll see how well that prints as a 16 by 20. You would need to go to 16 by... No, I'm sorry. 13 by 19. What am I talking about? Let's go to our calculator. So, 13... Divided by what? We need 300, 360 pixels per inch. 360. Wait a second here. What was the uh, dimensions? Yeah, we would need um, just for the 13 inch 4,680 pixels. We only have currently 699 or so let's call it 700. Okay, so it's going to be it's going to be a ridiculous thing to do. But we'll see, okay? We want to look to see how well the upresing or upsizing algorithm of Q image and we're going to use that so-called deep focus sharpening as well i'll walk you through guys walk you through that as well yeah there were some things that he did implement and there's a lot of things that i haven't even touched yet um 
on Q image. I'm leaving everything at the default setting for the moment just to see how this works. I just want to see how well all of this works. If I run into problems, then I will run into problems. Okay, let's talk about the Pro 1000 and the chip disabling procedure. I refuse to do this last time because it's going to take too long, but I think we have enough time. So normally, I'm going to talk about or describe normally the way you would go normally. You buy a new cartridge and you have it sitting, waiting. Let's just say yellow is running out quickly. You're printing a lot of images that contain a lot of yellow. Whatever, either yellow by itself or colors that require yellow or combinations of all three. Could be anything. And you realize you're, re you're reaching low and you're worried. But you know what? If you weigh a full one, it's 112 grams. An empty one like this one is 32 grams. And usually when it is low, that yellow warning comes on, you weigh the cartridge and it will weigh somewhere around 50 something grams. You still have relatively good amount of ink in there. So normally you continue printing and at some point it just goes red X. You see a red X. Your only option is to replace that cartridge with a new one. That's it. Or you could, I mean, single use chips. Refill the cartridge either directly through the port using a vacuum pressure method. You have to know how to do that. Or you have drilled a hole and you just basically add 80 milliliters of ink. Plug it back up. Remove this cap carefully. Remove the chip. Put a new chip in it. It floats. You see that? It's not It's not glued on or welded on. It's, it's floating in there. And so you reinstall it back in your printer and you're good to go. It'll read as a genuine chip and it will then be full. Here is <clears throat> how you do it if you want to re so-called um, disable the chip or disable ink monitoring for that particular channel. And why the hell would you want to do that? Right? Why would you want to do that? Because you're going to refill from now on. Okay? And you do not care about having to pay 12 to $14 per chip every time. Now, a original cartridge with a full load of ink and a new chip sets you back about $59.99. So that's almost $60. A empty cartridge filled with third-party ink, that'll be about $15 worth of ink and a chip. So let's just call it, I don't know, $27, right? Yeah, that's about right. $27, $28 total per refill. That's not super cheap. If you go OEM refill, which Precision Colors offers, that's going to be about $34 for the refill plus a chip, another $13. You're getting close to the $60 mark there. Not quite, still a little bit cheaper. So let's do away with the chip, and that'll save you that $13. And the only way to do that is to disable it. They cannot reset these. So let's disable it. Let's do it the right way. So you've already committed to disabling the chip before it even gets too low. Drill that hole. I like to use a hand drill. You don't have to be super precise. But with two drills, like a little 16th inch diameter hole, I mean drill, or oh, use an awl Make a little mark on there. Carefully drill that 16th inch diameter or metric as close as you can get it. Um, pilot hole. Then use your 5 32nds of an inch plastic cutting drill. 
there's a specific grind to the drill that will create a very clean cut on plastic, gummy type plastic like this. Drill it. Drills have a reverse helix. They pull the chips out. But be very careful you don't push anything in, by all means. Now you're going to get a little exacto blade. It takes a little while to prep these up. Exacto blade and clean any of the edges. You may have a little bit of a ridge raised. Just shave it off. Again, don't let it fall inside. Now you're going to have a hold onto which one of these little low-profile plugs fits extremely secure. With the plug removed, top off the cartridge. Oh, I may overflow it. No, you will not. If you put it on a scale, you just do not go beyond 112 grams. Simple as that. Put the plug back on it. So what have you done? You had a cartridge that was, say, halfway down. That's not close to low yet. You drilled a hole. You cleaned it. You made sure that plug fits tightly, snugly. You need to seal it, obviously. And so at this point, you top it off. Now you have a mismatch. You have a full cartridge, but this chip says you're not full. The chip may say you're halfway down. That's okay. Continue printing. If any other cartridges are in that same condition, say like halfway down, drill them, top them off. Precision color signature edition inks are so good, you can just add them to the existing OEM ink. In fact, the kit that you get, the basic kit contains four OEM colors or liquids, let's just say chrome optimizer, which is a clear coat, yellow, red, and blue. So use those. The other colors are not so critical, and they are already as good as OEM. It's just those four could not be brought up. He's a perfectionist to the quality of OEM. He could not, regardless. The components that labs have access to are not the same as Canon's lab, okay? Period. Whether you accept that or not, period. It's the truth. So otherwise, he could have done it, okay? He could not. So he substituted those four with OEM. He has to buy big old 700 milliliter cartridges, drain them of their ink, and then use that ink to sell it to you. That's, that's an extra step and an extra cost because he's not really making a lot of money out of this. He's, he's actually almost breaking even when it comes to the selling to you a load of 82 ml. He gives you 82 instead of 80 of OEM compared to the cost per ml of a 700 ml cartridge. He may be making a dollar per sale. So again... He's doing this because it's the only way to provide you with the best quality you can expect. Now, so you refill all the cartridges as needed. They're going to have more ink than the chip is reporting. That's the secret. Continue printing. At some point, one of those cartridges that was getting close to being low is going to be triggered low. Okay, how does this happen? Okay, here comes the fun part. You have a cartridge. Let's start from the cartridge. This does not move. It sits in the front. There's there is a, a, a gradual drop to the bottom, the floor of this cartridge, sort of ramp down ramp, the port right here, and it connects to your printer. Beyond that is a piece of tubing. I don't know whether it is flexible or metal or whatever and there's a valve a valve that either opens or closes so beyond that there is a compartment one for each color and a certain amount of ink is constantly stored in those compartments so let's just pick one compartment assume it is full you begin to print 
at the top level of that liquid ink, there's a sensor, a wet sensor. Start printing, ink starts to drop. Ink is being used by the printhead directly from that compartment, not from the cartridge. There's a valve that has shut down. Ink from the cartridge is not flowing anywhere. The compartment is losing its ink level. How much? I have no idea. They don't tell you that. But in the service manual, they show a compartment with sensors. So the upper sensor is, again, a wet sensor. You use some of the ink. Now you have airspace. Okay, fine. Nothing so far. Then there's a second sensor, not quite at the bottom, but above the bottom or above the bottom of that compartment. When that sensor sees air, it says, whoops, open the valve. Valve opens, ink flows by gravity, and that sensor begins to be covered by ink. Ink level rises. Uh oh, it's getting to the top. Oh, it touches that other wet sensor. That valve is closed down again. You have refilled the compartment with a specific amount of ink. Brilliant, isn't it? It's not measuring droplets of ink being put on paper. It's literally measuring how much. Every time you refill that compartment, you add an exact amount of ink. So it knows. It keeps adding up that ink. So when it has used up enough ink from a originally full cartridge that you haven't tampered with yet, it knows when the low warning should be triggered. Okay? It knows how many cycles of replenishing that compartment have taken place since the beginning. Okay? Let's just say 5 ml, 10 ml, 15 ml, 20 ml, and so forth. Or 3, 6, 9, 12, like that, whatever. It doesn't matter. It knows exactly how many times that compartment has gone from the top to where the point where it triggers that secondary wet sensor. That's, that's critical. Valve opens, ink dribbles ink, reaches the top, triggers that other the upper sensor, and the valve closes. That's it. Now, at the low warning, see, it's already computed how much ink I've used. I know I started with 80. You see, it knows it started with 80, so it knows at what point the low warning should take place. Well, low warning comes up. But really, you have nearly a full cartridge full of ink. The sensor system doesn't know that. There is absolutely nothing that connects electronically or any other shape or form this cartridge with the components inside your printer that are computing all of this information for you. Okay, so here's the trick. You got to follow this to the letter or it will not work. So it continues printing. Refills the sensor, I mean the the compartment again and again. Let's just say, let's say for instance that you have, I don't know, what's a good number? 20 ml left. So let's just use five to make things easier or four. So 20. I got 20 and then I'm going to go empty. 20. 16. 12. Eight, four, zero. Wait a minute. I I should have no ink left. This still has a lot of ink in it. So somehow it reaches what should be empty. But somehow that sensor that triggers that valve to open, ink is still coming in. How in the hell is that possible? See, before... Literally, to the ML, ink would stop flowing, 
Okay, here's how here's how the empty cartridge condition or the empty chip and cartridge condition works. You literally ran out of ink. It asked you to refill it, but you only had like three ml left. And it refilled it, refilled it, refilled it, but not quite. So it knows at that point that your cartridge is empty because it never reached the top. It never reached the top and it never actuated the secondary sensor on the top. It will allow you to continue printing and it prints, prints, prints. The second sensor gets triggered. Oh shit, now what? <laughs> excuse, so excuse my French. And it goes, continues, continues, and then the third sensor is triggered. The third sensor says, uh, red X, stop. Everything stops. Well, when you are constantly replenishing these, you never run out of ink. So that third sensor is never, ever triggered. Never. What happens at this point is that the printer just continues printing. It never goes below low warning. And you think, gosh, how long is this going to last? Continue printing. Don't worry. Just continue refilling your cartridges. Continue printing. At some point, you're going to wake up one morning. You're going to go to your printer. You're going to start a job. It'll do a cleaning cycle. You know it's going to do that. And then you'll get an error. It'll be on the screen, 1753. And you go, ah, what happened? It's not going to tell you to do something. Just accept that, 1753. Press the secondary button underneath the power button. Five seconds, you will see processing. And then it stops that channel, yellow, CEO, whatever it is, will now be disabled. It will appear on your LCD screen, on your com on your printer, not the computer. On your printer, it will show up as full. On your screen, computer that is, on your so-called driver, it will appear as empty. I'll show you what we have now. All of mine are now disabled, and that happened. The last one finally happened just the other day. Take a look at that. Empty. But I know they're all full. Well, now the thing is, I can continue to print. But I got to be careful. I no longer have the help of those sensors. I have to print. The sensors are operating. They're allowing that internal compartment to be replenished properly. But it's not going to help me if I run out of ink, all right? So I have to make sure that I always have ink in my cartridges, but I have a so-called sensor system installed on each cartridge and it, it will record and maintain the light off when I have above 20%. When I any cartridge drops to below 20%, the light will come on and it will tell me which cartridge. Also the sensor on the cartridge itself will turn itself off. So say for instance, the yellow sensor turns off and the equivalent yellow light on my little boards turns on. That means it's time to top off my yellow cartridge. But again, just be aware that you have to do that process a specific way, not just any old way. Any old way is not gonna work. It's gotta be a specific way. You cannot let that chip go empty. So it gets red X and press that pause button. You can press it all day long. It's not going to do anything. Your option <clears throat> is to start again. Brand new cartridge, and then do it right this time. Before it goes low, modify the cartridge for refilling, top it off to make sure it just never, ever runs out of ink. I am talking about, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Ch -ch 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 -ch. 
Okay. Yeah, hang on. Oh, Orange County Choppers, yeah. Yeah, you bet, right there. I used to watch those guys. They came to um, our hospital. I have, hold on. Hold on, you guys. We took their photograph. They came to the hospital to uh, visit our patients. And uh, I printed this on the an original R2000. Not R2000. Original, uh, what was it called? Stylus Photo 2000. And it is as good as new. It has not faded whatsoever. That was one of the first pigment printers Epson ever put out. How long was that? Gosh. When was the Gulf War? Way back then. That, the original Gulf War. When when senior uh, Bush was in power. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. I'm a big fan. Bill Hood enters. What? I don't need to enter. See? What are talking about? Luminical. Greetings from South Florida. Canon Pro 100 and OEM Inks. And he says, uh, guys, I just joined. What printer system is Jose? Talking about currently the Pro 1000. Yes. And it, this, whatever I explain, is also applicable to all the um, uh, newer printers as well. All right, so 1991, so he, they probably came in 1992, I would say, to visit. That's when we had a bunch of uh, wounded people there, soldiers. I was already uh, retired. I had been retired about two years already in 1991. So, yeah, that's a lot of years. So that would be 30 years ago, 31 years ago. That's how long that print has lasted without a sign of fading at all. Yeah, you could do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I used to do that with my uh, Color Monkey. And it works quite well. Same type of... Uh, actually, it's probably the same unit as the i1 Studio. Let's look at the driver, the maintenance tab, actually, specifically. I'm going to, I'm just going to overlap this over my Q image, if you don't mind. So people were asking, let me go back here first. So you have your quick, your main page setup. Now, let's not do any of this. We don't have to do any of this now that we're using Q image, folks, okay? But go here. This is the Pro 1000. Remember I mentioned about those forced borders, right? So click on that. Cancel the safety margin registration for paper size right there. I ha always have that activated. None of the other ones have to be activated. Just this one. This will allow you, in the cases where you are going to print using a paper that will block you from having, say, only a quarter-inch border. It demands to have that 30 to 35 millimeter border leading and trailing. That's a pain in the you-know-what. It will disregard that, and you will no longer have to worry about those borders. So that is there. I don't know whether that's available on the Pro 300, the newer uh, replacement for the Pro 10 or not. All right, let's go to maintenance tab. So you have a power off button. You can turn off your printer from your computer. But something like the Pro 1000, every time you power it off, simply because you think you're going to save on your electric bill, not a good idea because when you power it back on, 
it's going to think it was off for a month. Yeah, it's going to give you a very large initial cleaning cycle. Auto power. So normally the default for this would be, let me move this over, would be to have um, auto power on or auto power off. So I'm going to go ahead and disable both. Okay, I don't want it to go to sleep. I don't want it to turn off after a certain time either. So mine is on constantly apply to printer constantly on custom setup what is in here oh quiet settings this is another one so quiet setting it's a weird little you know option do not use in quiet mode all it's doing is printing a little bit faster it's not pausing between passes this is going to be physically quiet but in reality, what it's doing, it is pausing. So it's like driving slower instead of driving fast. When you drive fast, constantly with your foot on the gas, you're going to possibly, if your radiator system is not so good, you may overheat your engine. The same thing here. So you're pausing. You're allowing the thermal print hit to rest even a fraction of a second more. It's just going to sound quieter as well. It's going to print slower as well. So less explosions per second, in other words. So that is something that I like to always have active. There's no child in the house that I need to uh, worry about disturbing at night. So there's always a, a you can set up a setting for specific times during the day where you want to make sure you're printing quietly. No, there's no need to do that. So we're going to leave it on as that. And uh accept that as well now here are some other options and the only important one that i would i would disable is this one here do not detect mismatch of paper size because on the driver on your computer you can have a specific size let's forget about q image now you don't have q image and on your screen on the printer it also has specific paper sizes. If you have a mismatch between those two, say you have eight and a half by 11 on your printer, but you chose 13 by 19 on the driver, it's gonna have a mismatch and it's gonna bother you. So do not bother me with that, just disregard it. So I always have that click. Now here is disable paper width detection when printing from computer. Uh, no, don't do that either. Leave that, leave that as off. Okay. Don't do that. What else? Those of you who use the media configuration tool or, you know, in other words, you create your custom configuration for a paper that's not even considered inkjet, let's just say, and you create that file and you then install it through the media configuration tool. The only way you're going to activate it to appear on your driver is by clicking on this, update. And you're going to get this window. You execute. OK. I don't know whether I have some or not. We'll see. Sure is going through a lot of um, configuration. I know at one time I used to have some. Let that finish up. And then we're going to close the driver down and restart it. Okay, so... It has been updated. We're going to close that. And we'll restart the driver. Pro 1000 driver. And what is going to be different, folks? What is going to be different? You don't see anything different? Anything different at all? Well, before... I go on my paper media type drop down and I would have one, two, three, four categories. Now I have 
custom. So here are some custom so-called modifications or uh, what is it called? Configurations that I have already installed in my computer, but I never configured them. I never added them. So when you do that, what you're doing is now you have, look at this. See that? Photo paper plus glossy. That's a Canon paper. Photo paper pro platinum. That's a Canon paper. If I want to use a Red River paper, you would never have a Red River paper showing off. Now you do. So simply what I did was I downloaded the configuration files and I installed them through my configuration tool. But I never activated them, obviously, until now. These were not available before. Now they are. Now, I don't have to change, for instance, Art White, Art Natural. Those are matte, very textured papers. Normally, they tell you, if you're going to print with those, then you need to choose a matte paper, like matte photo paper or fine art matte. I no longer have to do that. I can literally choose that actual paper. It's actually listed by name now. Isn't that awesome? So if you guys have access to that tool, it's a free download. Uh, printers like the Pro 1000 and up are capable of using it. So I recommend you do that and go to your paper manufacturer's website and see if they have the configuration files. I forget what the, what the, the dot whatever it is. Uh, designator is but you can download those through your configuration tool install them and then activate them by running that functionality here in the maintenance tab right here update media information okay that'll get you all set up let's talk about cleaning cycles nozzle checks that sort of thing so if you need a cleaning cycle on the pro 1000 that means you haven't used it for so long that even after the initial cleaning, it did not work. Yeah, it can happen. Click on it. Now you have three options. Your basic cleaning. It's not going to be as, as, as long and as wasteful as the other two. Notice, they only show one little droplet. Here shows three droplets, and here shows six droplets. X amount. 2x, 4x, okay? Or 6, maybe 6x, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, so here's something critical that you need to keep your eye on when you con when you purposely on your own run an nozzle check. Not a nozzle check, a clean cycle. And this is ap applicable to the Pro 100, the Pro 10, the Pro 200, the Pro uh, 300, 2100, all of those big ones as well. They have compartmentalized printheads, meaning they are subdivided into zones. So in this case, we have 12 channels. If, for instance, let's just say blue channel has a few little bars missing. Don't run it all, all colors. You're going to waste ink from the other eight. Run only group three which contains blue, yellow, magenta, and photocyan. If any of those colors are missing slightly on any one of those channels in that nozzle check, don't run all colors. You're going to be wasting ink equally across the board. Only the group that has the affected color. Okay. If you have, say, PG gray, or and and pc then you'll have to run a clean cycle for that and a clean cycle for that but you don't need to run a clean cycle for group two so be aware of that choose those you know make those choices uh smartly this is a huge one folks this is pretty much a recharge okay so be aware of that your nozzle check is situated right here print the pattern You're going to get this, and then you print. Remember, I don't have any ink monitoring anymore. So you're going to get, this is what you're going to get. 
And what you do is you look at your results and make sure you're not missing anything at all. You will have nothing but crisscrosses on each one of the 12 channels. You have to make sure that none of them are missing any of the little crisscrosses that you will normally get. And that is it. Don't, don't be wasteful and then choose, you know, to do all 12 at the same time. On the Pro 10, the Pro 100, you have two groups, Group 1 and Group 2. On the Pro 100, it's obviously eight colors. So it's the first group is four and four. Pro 10 will be five and five. And you can see that very clearly here. You can see that the nozzle plate is subdivided. Now, the perch unit is able to apply suction on the chosen one because it has also been compartmentalized or subdivided. It's really neat. I wish Epson, Epson, listen, listen to me. You need to do this. You need to include this in your printers please it's crazy okay let's go ahead and print that image let me go ahead and choose 13 by 19 on the eco tank I don't know why I have such a hard time finding it. It's right here, Super B. Now, remember, folks, remember what size I had set? Remember, it was a square with a uh, one-inch border, right? So it centered it. And, of course, we have a huge leading and trailing edge border. But it has a right and left one inch border. We're going to do away with that. And we want to print, say, not a 16 by, not a 13 by 19. It won't fit. Watch, if I try to do that, it's going to say, sorry, buddy, it's not going to fit. Or let's see, 16, 13. Yeah, it's not going to fit. 13 by 19, not going to fit. You see what I mean? So you have to choose something smaller. So let's go ahead and create a border we want i don't know half inch border how about that so we're going to do 0.5 and we don't want that one what we want is actually located in my desktop this one we'll get rid of this it remembers everything you did last time. Okay, keep that in mind. Every time, if I switch printers, it's going to remember whatever I did on that printer the last time I used it. So that can be confusing. Let's throw that on there. Remember, what did I tell you the resolution for this was? Let me go ahead and open it up on the editor. It's 1144 by 699. There it is. Now we're going to go ahead and add a little bit of uh, sharpening. DFS. And you have other, other uh, un unsharp mask. We want DFS. I'm going to go ahead and just add a radius of one and increase this to say, I don't know, let's just say 50. I don't want to make it too, too high. Boom. And okay. And Let's see what else we have to do. Done. I'm not going to give it a name because this is just temporary. Now let's go back to my settings. So I am not using Red River. I'm using what? Epsom paper. Again, I got to choose that here because my screen is only like five inches. So let's pick the correct paper premium glossy and it changed it i just saw the warning isn't that amazing hold on let me change it to some other some other paper presentation mat 
See, remember that that's not the size I used. Just want to show you guys that. Let's go ahead and go back to glossy. Okay, so now we are at 13 by 19. And of course, that's the wrong size because that's that's not what we did the very, very last time. So we'll change this. We'll accept that border. Boom and boom. There we go. Now we're going to go ahead and make sure our properties are okay. Yeah. I saw a, a change. So this is letting the printer control color. The printer itself is going to control color. It's going to apply the correct ICC profile for Epson. What is it? Premium Photo Paper Glossy. That's it. Let's print. I want to, I'm not super concerned about color accuracy. I, I want to see how in the heck is going to be able to print this to 13 by 19. That's, that's what I want to see. So 13 by 19, we're good to go. We're going to hit print. We're going to freeze up right now. When it queues it up, we'll be right back. About three quarters of the way there. I don't think we're freezing up at all. That's good. Okay, 100. We'll go ahead and close a few image for the time being. I think we're going to be done anyway. And so we are now printing. As you can see. We have dropped our levels a little bit. Not bad. Take a peek behind us and see what's going on. It's going to feed the paper. Uh oh, wait a minute. I think it, I think I had a mistake. Oh no, wait a minute, what is it doing? It's doing a cleaning, I think. Folks, it's actually doing a cleaning. By the way, this is um what an extra fifteen thousand paper jam inside the printer. Oh what do you mean? Is it I just canceled it. We will try that again, folks. I need to check to make sure it's not making a, a uh, trying to print on the um, plain paper. Gee, always something when it's live, right? Yes, Q image. We'll try that again. I won't bother you with looking at the actual program. We'll go ahead and make sure that we got the uh, rear feeder activated. Yep, glossy and maybe it just got jammed a little. Yeah, re yeah, real feeder is activated. So again, these printers like the XP 15,000, they sometimes have a bit of a printing uh, or paper handling issue. You see how I am skipping right now? It's loading up. I'll make sure that I am feeding the paper correctly. Sometimes you got to babysit these a little bit. We're 
almost done. All right. Yeah, it sounds like it's, it's, it wants to use the uh, cassette. Huh? Oh, here we go. No, I was wrong. It's actually feeding. I've had that happen with the XP15000, where it's, it's, it gets confused and starts using the cassette instead of the, the rear feeder. All right, so that's that's our image. We'll, I just want to really just see what kind of quality we get from an obviously way too low resolution. That should only be printed, let's see, if we divide by 300 and let's just say 300, make it easier in the math. We should only be able to get, oh my gosh, like a, like a, th like a two and a half. So it's, it's 1100 and let's call it 1150. Divide by 300, that's like three inches and a half wide. A wallet size. And we're making it 13 by 19. Nothing should be able to, to produce uh, a quality result. You know what? I think it's on high quality right now, which is the default for QMH nowadays. So it's going to take a little bit of a, of a while to print. No problem. We'll just let it do its thing. And while we are waiting, let's see if anyone else has any other comments here. So Luminacle created a black and white profile. That was, yeah, that's available on the uh, so-called... Um, software you can actually choose that and it will print uh, the color patches in, in that case it'll be um, sort of close to being neutral color patches and you'll arrive at a at a very very good high performing profile just for black and white you can also do uh, what is called a optimized profile so if you have an image that has particularly difficult colors, you can actually create a secondary profile that will be piggybacked onto the original. Okay, the way it works is that it will you it will access that particular image. This is going to give you it's like a custom profile just for that image. So you load the image as you are you ask for the for updating or or um, upgrading a particular pro profile for whatever paper, the same as that. So you want to create a specific separate profile using the original profile as a base, but you want to actually access some trouble colors, troublesome colors in that image. So it's going to walk you through. It's going to ask you to open up your image, what image you want to make the profile for, It'll select that image. It will select the colors. It will create a custom set of color patches. You print those, scan them, go through the process again, and now you name that profile a specific name um, that's basically linked to that image. Boom. You now get as good a result from that image that may have had some, like, out-of-gamut colors. It will bring it to the maximum possible quality. It's amazing. I've done that before many times. I selected the profile type when I, yeah, uh, you have to, you just, you just select it as normal. You will be printing not on black and white mode anymore. You'll be printing in RGB and then just choose that profile. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. When I do soft proof on a color image using a custom black and white profile perceptual 
goes to black and white and relative stays as a color image. Any thought as why that is? I find that very interesting. I don't know. I've never done any um, soft proofing using a so-called black and white profile. That I do not know. If only that 8550 were 17 inch wide. Well, not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course it's going to misbehave. Of course. Yeah. Uh, no, that's not going to happen. That was a discussion we had, uh, Mike and I, and he just laughed at me. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you're getting a blue, you were getting a blue color cast hmm. from the very beginning when I did the big test comparison between, all right, between OEM and um, uh, PC Signature Edition. Either, either, either inks did not produce a color cast. I don't know why people are having color casts. Are you on a Mac or PC? I've heard weird stories about having um, your preview activated on your driver, like print preview, and that would cost a color cast. But it was supposed to be toward magenta, not not bluish. PC, okay, yeah, that's weird. Are you using um, OEM or other inks? Almost done. This is this is ridiculous. Okay, don't mind the initial mess. I think I had the paper on wrong, and that that happens with the XP fifteen thousand. All these printers have. A very similar paper feeding uh, system. I quite often have to feed, I have to help the paper. So this is not something you're going to load up 10 sheets and walk away. No, no, don't do that. Oh, yeah, it could be. Were you using the correct profile? You could print, you can print black and white using full color mode. It'll use all the colors. It will then composite your grays. All your grays, it'll be neutral. Assuming you got your color matching correctly. If you use a custom profile, you have to set your, your uh, color mode to none. If you use QImage, it does that automatically for you. Are we done? No, not yet. Boy, this is going to be super high quality. It's the slowest setting possible. Almost done. All right. Okay. <laughs> Get ready. This is an image that should have only been printed as a wallet size. See what I'm talking about, folks? It's all about the so-called algorithm. How can it create pixels? I'm reflecting the screen right on it, dude. It creates pixels so perfectly taking into account the existing detail or lack of. Okay, this, you can't see it here, but this is, this, the, there are lines that are part of the graphic right here, little elements. You cannot see that on this video. There, maybe you can right there. You can see some horizontal lines. This is, this is simulating what, like what a screen, you know how when they try to simulate on, on shows, something from a camera and they put scanning lines on it. That's what this is simulating. And they are sharp. See, when I, I'm going to give this to my grand, my uh, son, my 40-year-old. He loves this stuff. So I'll, I'll, I'll give him this one. But that is glorious. I cannot believe that. And it's a little bitty image. You saw the dimensions. Let me, in fact, let me, let me show you the image again. 
We'll load it up. It's just so small. See that? And so what it does, it interpolates, creates more pixels to give me the 360 per inch that I need for 13 by 19. That would be 13 times 360, 19 times 360. Actually, not quite. I do have a half inch border. So let's just call it 12 by 18, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's making a heck of a lot of pixels where, where you know they don't really exist very difficult to see here but you can see how quickly it loses detail but yeah that's q image for you if for anything uh one of the main reasons i i i use it is because it allows me to save jobs and that is something that i find extremely valuable if you do any kind of uh, event photography where you're going to have a session on such a such a date if you if you if you work with uh kids sports and you set up a shoot where every team member gets gets a photograph you save it as a job and that where when aunt millie wants a set of pictures of her son or or you know nephew you can pull it up that date or the name of the team open it as a job, it will access all the images that were involved in that job that you created, the printer, the size, the paper type, the dimensions, the layout, whatever, it is all saved for you. And I, I can't come up with any other program that will give me that flexibility. If you do weddings, nowadays, nobody wants prints for weddings. That's, that's unfortunate. But Anything that involves printing, lots of different prints, different people. I just went to my friend's party. The friend's wife was 80. And so I shot a bunch of pictures. I saved that as a job. And I printed them for them. I saved that as a job. If a year later he loses his pictures, I can reprint them. Click, click, job. Boom, everything's open. Hopefully, I will still have that printer, and I can go ahead and just load the same paper and print everything as if it was last year, you see. So it's just invaluable, among many other things. So it will allow you to also um, basically analyze your images. Like, I could have analyzed that image. I don't know whether I have that. Uh, activated it or not. Let me quickly show you that before we go off. We only got about 10 more minutes. We're going to do a complete uh, three-hour show today. So, Q image. Show you what I'm talking about. So, we'll load that same image. Now, So if we go here and click on that little tool, we have an option. So I have on my own decided that everything I print will be on relative colorimetric as a default. But you can, you can um, click on here. <clears throat> and it will analyze that image. See, I I know I have previously checked this image to see if it has any out of out of uh, gamut colors. So, for instance, the standard image you're supposed to print that in relative colorimetric, not perceptual. You don't want it to shift any colors that are out of gamut inside. And it also pushes the other colors that are already in gamut to make room for those out of gamut colors. You don't want that to happen. You want it, whatever's in, in gamut, I want it to remain in gamut. The same thing here. But if I just have this activated, let me see here. If I have this activated, 
auto, then it's going to make a determination on its own. It's going to look at the image. It's behind your back. It's going to analyze it. And, and it's going to determine which, which perceptual or relative would be better. And all it's trying to do is get as many colors within the gamut of your printer, within the ability of your printer to reproduce them as closely as possible. Accept the fact that it's not going to be perfect ever, okay? Ever. So I'm going to leave it in auto for now just to see how that works out for me. And notice here, full 16-bit images and profiles. So it's going to actually look at your images and, and try to reproduce them as if Windows was able to print 16-bit. It cannot. It can only print 8. But that's why the Canon so-called uh, high uh, bit rate um, driver is created because it's basically simulating 16-bit printing in a Canon printer. And that only is applicable for uh, Windows operating system. On a Mac, you can print directly from 16-bit, no problem. Okay, so he is using uh, Red River, okay. And did you make sure that color matching was set to off, to none? Because that's that's a uh, common cause for color match uh, problem. Color cast, that is. If you're communicating via Wi-Fi, I wonder if it is a network issue, although it should not be the case closing Q image so quickly may have affected communication over Wi-Fi. Uh, what do you mean? You mean the freezing when it's when it's queuing up? No, that's normal from Q image. That Q image is just using all your resources, and I'm streaming at the same time. So, Jack and Cook. Wow, are you saying wow at the results that I got from that lousy low resolution image? That is ridiculous. Yeah, that would be, let's see. We have, again, uh, 1144 by 699. I remember when cameras were only capable of that uh, level of resolution. Okay. Well, then, I don't know what to say. Um Yeah, always a custom profile, you know, solves. Now, on printers such as the 1400, those were incapable of producing uh, good monochrome printing because um, if you did a, a, a an image that had a full range of tones from, you know, dark areas, middle ground, and highlights, it would change tone. It was not linear at all. It was not neutrally linear. And only after producing a profile, the, the R2000 as well, the P400, there's no gray inks. So it has a very difficult time producing a very good linearly neutral print. You need a profile, whether it's a black and white profile or, or just a common com, uh, color profile. Yeah, so do a profile and see what, what that does. How satisfied have you been with the black and white prints on the... Well, let's make one. How about that? We have a few more minutes. Let's do a black and white. Let's see what we have here. If I have any more glossy paper, let's see. Yep, I do. We could do a standard image, a standard black and white image. I think I have one here.
I appreciate you guys asking for impromptu things. I'm not always set up for such situations, but, you know, glad to be able to uh, do this. Let's see. I need full pictures, and I need to look for my... Actually, you know what? Let's see. I got some black and white photos here somewhere. I don't want to waste that whole 13 by 19 just for a standard image. Let me see if I have any black and whites here. Ah, here we go. Oh, yeah. Give me one second, guys, and I will. That is black and white, right? Yeah. No, that doesn't look like black and white. That's a color image. It's a color image with hardly any color in it. Let's not use that one. It's beautiful, though. It's beautiful. Christine Bilby. Downloaded images. I want to find something that has a nice full array of tones. Okay, here's here's a good one. Okay, all right. There you go. We'll do that one. And uh, everything is already set. Same paper, same paper type, same setting. We're going to use RG RGB type printing. We're not going to use color mode, uh, black and white. We're going to print as if this was a color uh, image. It is a color image. It's RGB. It's just the same value throughout. Any tone you see here has the same value, RGMB. So let's go ahead and click print. Let it load. And I'll have to babysit the paper again. But only after it begins to print. Twenty five percent. Yeah, you see me skipping. Yeah. So you might notice eleven point nine five by eighteen point zero two. That's the printable area. We want to see whether we get a nice linearly neutral result. We're using OEM ink and we're using OEM paper, OEM profile through the printer driver itself. I'm going to close that, bring that over here, bring myself back on. I haven't messed around with changing the quality setting. I'm going to show you this again because this is amazing. Again, this, this would not be suitable except for a wallet size as far as the resolution goes. So, you know, do you really need to have, like, special up softwares? There are a few out there. I think that they have incorporated the same algorithm in QImage as these other softwares utilize. Back in the day, I was sold on a couple of profile, a uh, couple of softwares that allow you to up, up rest to a specific size way beyond what would be normally... Uh, able to do and so 
you know, I, I think already QMH does that. I just don't know, you know, how far you can push it. Some of these programs use AI. So in the case of um, uh, oppressing images that contain people, quite often what it does is recreates eyes. Literally, I mean, it creates a digital eyeball. And uh, that can look a little odd. If you can recognize a specific shape or object or something of the sort, that is a commonly found something. They will try to recreate it by AI. And that usually gives you a very funny looking result. I just wanted to mess with the pixels only, not try to recreate, you know, my grandson's eyeballs. No, that's not gonna work. By the way, the printer black and white mode did the best job minimizing the color cast versus supply. Yeah, black and white mode always works. And you can always very gradually adjust the overall tonality. Just warm it up, cool it down, make it, if it's magenta, add a little green and so forth and vice versa. Yeah, AI giga, gigapixel. I just feel like it's not really necessary. And uh, I don't need to create, you know, some a 50, uh, you know, megapixel image just to, no, I just use QImage. Got an itchy nose. It must be coming into some money. Okay, the 8550 has a little light right there. I think it's a color balance light, even. And so I am looking at the results that we're getting. Um, this room is dark right now. I'm only illuminated by the window light and this little LCD LED light here. I don't even have this one turned on yet. Okay, that's going to take a while to print, but it's looking good. I think it's going to be really good. That's because you're used to something else, okay? That's why you're used to regular programs like Photoshop and Lightroom and other other menu uh, type type uh, programs. Actually, like dark darkroom, uh, Lightroom is completely different UI than than Photoshop, and uh, I had a hard time getting used to that. I've used QImage since it since it began. So I've got I've grown used to the interface. You just gotta get you just gotta learn it. It's just different, and it's different on purpose. For pass prints with details on setting, not workable. I don't know what you're asking. I find the user interface for past prints with details on settings if you everything is saved everything god no you should see how many jobs oh my goodness uh how many jobs mike has saved a lot more than i do but yeah everything is saved it saves every setting um like I, if i open up um we're still waiting here. If I open up, let's open up a Pro 1000. God, I don't remember when I used QImage in the Pro 1000 last. So let's open up the Pro 1000 and see. So the last time I, I used the Pro 1000, I was using uh, Photo Paper Plus Glossy 2 and letter size that's it and i was letting the driver manage color that's why you saw that little warning come up you see so let's see what i was using on the xp fifteen thousand. and let's let's not waste time on that let's go over here 
Let's go ahead and go directly to the recall folder. And we will open up this Janine, my, my wife, right here. So we were at Cracker Barrel and I took a phone. I took a picture with my little uh, GoPro camera. So you see, you see her right there and we're sitting at Cracker Barrel. And this happened on 2022 at 19, 20 hours. No, 0630. No, yeah, 1920 hours. Okay. So we'll open that up as a job. And there it is. I did this job. I wanted this size print and then a bunch of little ones. And then I had this other. So it remembered that. It remembered that. Let's open up another job. I don't know if this is what you're uh, referring to. Remove that one. Okay, so we got this layout now. We're going to go ahead and look for another job. Okay, this is... Um, Nathan did a project for school uh, about Puerto Rico, where I was born. Nathan's PR project job that was done... Uh, 2021. So let's go ahead and click on that job. It changed the layout and it, this is the way I laid it out. And then I went ahead and trimmed those little images out. So I don't know, is, is this what you were asking about? Or was it something different? And if I want to do a picture package, I already have that set up. Let's click 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 and click 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 now notice they're all different ratios and sizes let's make one little change so we're going to go ahead and click here and click on auto cropping off now it's going to fit every one of the images regardless of its original so-called uh, ratio to this size. What are we printing? We are printing two and a half by three and a half. So they're all going to be fitted perfectly. Watch this. One, two, regardless of their original ratio. They're going to be cropped. Yes, they are going to be cropped. So what? But they're going to be exactly the same size. This one's definitely not that ratio. And it's going to be cropped. That's 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 the way this works. Boom! I got it. All a bunch of two and a half by three and a half from images. Yes, they were cropped because they have to be cropped. They all had different aspect ratios. Okay. If I do not click on that little auto crop, then they will be fitted in their whole uh, complete uh, corner to corner. But they're not going to be two and a half by three and a half. They're going to be whatever the size is because they were not cropped. Okay. Let's go ahead. We're not even going to undo that. Let's go ahead and choose another job. So I did a shot of a pigeon in San Juan. Actually, no, in Paris, France. I'm going to click on it. I don't know what I did here. It was some Canson uh, watercolor paper in the Pro 1000. Fine art, something, blah, blah, blah. White was, uh, fine art matte was chosen as the paper type. Job. And there it is. You see what I mean? Every job that I have saved is can be reloaded, uh, can be reaccessed and reloaded. So... I wonder whether that was what you were referring to or not. I love it. I absolutely love it. All right, let's take a look at this. Believe me, let me look at it on the mic. Yeah. 
Yeah, that is that is very neutral. Here it doesn't look so neutral. It looks a little bluish. But believe me, folks, it is neutral. It's just that I'm getting all kinds of different lights landing on it. If I was to look at it on daylight, let me see what it looks like on my window light. Yeah, dead neutral. Dead neutral by window light. And this is obviously a little bit bluer than I would need it to be that light. But anyway, it's at least across the board, linearly neutral. It looks very, very good. Yeah. Depends what angle I hold it. You see that? I got a red object right here on my monitor. My chair is reflecting red on it as well. I got some blue over here. So that is affecting the actual look. Let me see if I can curl it and aim it. But anyway, yeah. So, yeah, very capable. Super capable printer. I, I'm shocked by it. Will they make a 17-inch version with 10 colors? Absolutely not. Boy, wouldn't they would be kicking themselves in the you know what? Because who would then buy a high, you know, class two thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, you know, version of it? No, just because they had pigment inks, they wouldn't be able to print on glossy paper as well as we can with this printer using dye inks and. Because it has matte black pigment ink, it can print on matte paper as well. Let me show you one result. A couple of results, actually. Oh, here you go. Here's another one. Black and white. It is neutral. I know. On my screen, it looks a little bluish tell you the truth but it is not it is not bluish at all yep and you know what the beauty about printing black and white mode is that you can change the overall tone to whatever pleases you You want to make it a little cooler you want to make it a little bit warmer if you're printing on a matte paper that has a warm paper base like that aurora natural from red river you may want to skew it a little bit make it a little bit warmer yeah, not quite sepia, but just a tiny little bit warmer. And that will go very well with that warm paper base. How about subtle colors? This is on matte paper. This does it absolutely zero justice, folks. If you were here with me and you saw this, you would freak. It is so beautiful. It's a lone rider on a horse, obviously, Whatever place this is, I did not shoot this. This is someone else's shot. The shore, as far as you can see, it's only a couple of feet deep during the low tide. So, but just the subtlety of colors, this is the one that I mismatched the size. Yeah. Amazing stuff. This was actually mine. This is up front, my house. And again, you have to be here with me. You look at the the darks. This image has not one single black in it. So I made it purposely that way. And not one single area has a pure white. So I wanted to see what this printer that uses mostly dye inks just with one matte black or one pigment ink, the matte black, can do on matte paper. This is uh, Epson enhance matte this has been manipulated a little bit in photoshop so it looks a little bit too saturated but it handled it it handled it beautifully Whoop, the other way. Look at that. That's amazing. So yeah. Anybody had any any doubts? 
you know, about this. I had a lot of doubts about it. Hey, look who's here. Mike Cheney is here. Hang on one second. Has it? Then why did Canon have to create a so-called uh, XPS driver? Yeah. Well, I don't know what you know what it's actually doing. Um, but how can it print 16-bit if it has to go through Windows? I don't know. You guys are a lot smarter than me when it comes to that sort of thing, including you, Jerry. Will Carson says, thanks, I'm using QImage1. I will visit the QImage1 forum. What are you showing does not appear to me. What you are showing does not appear to me. Well, QMH1 will not have some of these things. Only QMH Ultimate. Thank you. Mike, you just got home at 4 and Jose is still going. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? I was printing on QMH, doing some things, some demos. All right. Yes, it is. And, and and guys, 8550 owners, whenever you need that that uh, maintenance cartridge replaced, you see this dude right here? That guy. There's a link of my video descriptions. Go to it. And you'll be able to get those those maintenance cartridges that according to that other person that posted that on the internet, uh is so-called to be is supposed to be a so-called built-in uh Printer death. No. He'll set you up. You'll be able to either remain with the same cartridge body and just replace the insides, um, install a new chip, or get a resetter. You may be able to reuse that cartridge several times before it actually has to be cleaned and repacked. Something to consider. All right. I think that's it. If anybody else has any other questions they may have, a, they may want to ask. Feel free to do so. If not, we'll just say bye bye for now. Let me see. Yeah, the Canon SPS driver has to bypass Windows API. So you guys are using terms that are I don't know anything about to get 16 bit before even because even Windows 11 is still eight bits per channel. Yeah. All right. You guys are the experts. I just, I just know how to print. Okay. All right. That is it for now. I'm going to say goodbye. I don't know what's happening upstairs, but I'm going to go up. I'm getting a little hungry and see what's happening there. Um, this week, uh, tomorrow we get Nathan. We're going to build a diorama. He's been uh, hell-bent on building dioramas, so, of course, Grandpa's going to jump in there and uh, help as much as possible. That's my job. Okie doke. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you all for coming again. We had a very successful live stream. We hit over 50 something uh, viewers, which is really awesome, even without a fancy guest. Yeah. All right. So we'll see you all next week. Again, happy printing, everybody. Bye bye. Let me post the other picture.